Metroid Prime 2 Echoes was released for the GameCube in 2004 and developed by Retro Studios. With the critical and commercial success of Metroid Prime, Retro had proven to both Nintendo and Metroid fans that they were more than capable of creating an authentic, polished Metroid experience. They had shown that Metroid's dense atmosphere and exploration-driven gameplay fitted perfectly into a first-person perspective, and the initial doubts and concerns that fans had quickly turned into enthusiasm and excitement to see what Retro would do next. Naturally, people wanted a sequel, and Retro had given themselves large boots to fill. Just two years after the first game, Metroid Prime 2 was released and received similar amounts of acclaim, with many critics praising it as a worthy sequel and a great step forward for the Metroid franchise. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing Metroid Prime 2 in depth to see how it lives up to its predecessor. I'm going to be comparing it to Metroid Prime 1, so I'd recommend watching my review on that first. Metroid Prime 2's story and mechanics will be discussed in their entirety, so spoilers for the whole game are present throughout. The game begins with a mission briefing explaining that a squad of Galactic Federation troopers on planet Ether have gone silent, and Samus has been hired to investigate. Upon entering Ether's atmosphere, Samus's ship is hit by lightning, causing her to crash land on the planet's surface. Like Prime's opening minutes, this cutscene isn't overly long and doesn't waste any time putting the player in control, starting the game's tutorial sequence. Since Prime 2's controls are identical to the first game, the tutorial here is more for newcomers to the franchise, briefly explaining the basic lock-on shooting and scanning mechanics with on-screen text prompts. These messages are brief and unobtrusive, so returning players aren't bombarded with information they already know and can quickly move through this sequence uninterrupted. The atmosphere of this section is perfectly crafted, and it's clear that Retro hadn't lost their touch. Ether is immediately eerie and uninviting, with slow droning synths and deep echoing percussion creating this foreboding tension as you explore the abandoned Federation outpost. The game is quick to establish its dark tone by having the player walk into a room littered with the dangling corpses of Federation troopers, hung from the ceiling with webbing from the surrounding swarm of insects. Things only get worse when the lifeless soldiers start to reanimate, shambling towards Samus and firing their weapons. Metroid has always been one of Nintendo's darker franchises, and it's never been afraid to explore the bleaker side of science fiction, but even so, this opening sequence is surprisingly grim. It's one thing to have Samus trudge through a research facility filled with dead space pirates, but it's another thing entirely to have her fight the reanimated corpses of her allies. Since this moment comes completely out of nowhere, it grabs your attention and pulls you into the game's story, motivating you to investigate and find out what happened to the Federation squad. Delving deeper into the outpost sees Samus encountering what appears to be a shadowy apparition of herself, ominously floating above the ground before disappearing into a dark portal. I love that the game briefly hands the controls back to the player after this cutscene. It would be out of character for Samus to recklessly chase after this strange creature. She'd likely hesitate and scan the portal first, which is what you as a player are likely to do as well. It's a nice little detail that establishes this as your adventure as well as Samus's. Beyond the portal, Samus finds herself in a cavern surrounded by strange creatures, with her doppelganger absorbing a nearby Phazon deposit. The creatures start to close in on her as the portal grows smaller, just managing to escape. So this is where the game informs you that you've lost your equipment, and it's just as poorly executed as it was in Prime. The message on your visor explains that the creatures stole the equipment, but considering that they barely touched Samus before she escaped, it seems strange that her suit is so easily compromised. Like I mentioned in my review of Prime, I can appreciate what the developers were trying to do here, but if they'd taken the time to think of something more plausible, it could have had the player much more invested in regaining their strength. This time around, Samus has retained her Morph Ball and Charge Beam. 
These were upgrades that were acquired fairly early in the first game and were utilised so much that they more or less became second nature to use. Returning players will likely have these items so ingrained into their gameplay experience that taking them away would have felt more jarring than anything else, so it's nice that they've been left in there. After taking an elevator out of the Federation base, you'll find yourself in the Temple Grounds, and it's worth noting how smoothly the game transitions from the tutorial to the main game. Thanks to the unobtrusive instructions and pacing, on my first playthrough it didn't even register that I'd just been through a tutorial section. By this point I was heavily invested in uncovering the mystery behind the squad of soldiers, so arriving in the Temple Grounds felt like I was simply moving forward and exploring at my own pace. Abandoned Federation equipment lies scattered around the Temple Grounds, accompanied by even more dead bodies, eventually leading to an empty Federation ship. Interfacing with a nearby terminal causes an expository cutscene to play, explaining why the squad went silent. It's a more direct method of storytelling than we're used to from the Metroid series, and I can't help but feel it breaks the immersion for a few moments. From the start of the game you've been piecing together information acquired by scanning the bodies and observing the environment, only to have the game outright tell you what you've probably begun to figure out by this point. This information could have easily been presented through the environment, having a few of the insects feeding on the soldiers, maybe a few dead insects lying amongst the bodies or something similar. Learning things through the scan visor is one of the things that I feel makes the Prime Trilogy unique, and this cutscene feels like a slight misstep in that regard. The scan visor itself returns in Metroid Prime 2 with some improvements. The small scan icons of Prime have been completely removed, and instead scannable objects and creatures are fully highlighted in various colours. Blue represents simple points of interest, and red represents crucial information. Once something's been scanned, it's highlighted bright green, indicating that it's been added to your logbook. This is a huge improvement over Prime, which had small icons that were slightly faded if you'd previously scanned them. Highlighting them in green means you can immediately tell if something's been scanned from just a quick glance. Scanning is pretty integral to the experience of the Prime games. It's the player's method of interacting with and learning about the game world, so it's nice that some time went into optimising the scan visor for the sequel. It remains an effective tool for giving the world some narrative depth, making the environments you explore feel as though they have a substantial history behind them. You can scan the Federation corpses to read data entries detailing their thoughts before they died, and it's a great way to give weight to the dead bodies scattered around the game's opening segment. They're not just props that are there to build tension, they're actual characters that experienced a military expedition gone wrong. One soldier's data entry talks about how he's frustrated that he's stuck on monitor duty when he could easily outshoot half his squad mates. Another talks about how his friend ran out of ammunition despite being notoriously stingy with his bullets. My favourite example is a soldier who's concerned that his colleague Haley is going insane. He's aggressive, barely sleeps, and frequently talks to himself. Later on you'll find Haley's body, and his data entry consists of paranoid ramblings about some force that's out to get him. These data entries probably took minimal effort to implement, but their overall effect on the game's atmosphere is huge. They're only short bits of text, but they're more than enough to create a sense of tension and nervous anticipation. Soon after learning the fate of the missing Federation squad, you'll stumble across the entrance to the Great Temple, where you'll meet Umos. After spending so much time exploring in solitude with the first game, there's something jarring about having a civilized creature talk directly to Samus. On my first playthrough, I remember feeling concerned that Retro had done away with the quiet and lonely atmosphere that made the Metroid series so immersive, but if anything, Umos only ever reinforces that atmosphere. With the exception of the game's ending, Umos is the only living member of the Luminoth that you encounter. The rest you come across are holographic recordings of Luminoth that have already died. That's a fairly grim situation for Umos to be in, and his desperation for Samus to save what's left of his species makes Aether an oppressive and lonely place. He explains that a meteor crashed into the planet, splitting it into two dimensions and creating Dark Aether. Hostile creatures known as the Ing emerged from Dark Aether and stole the energy of Light Aether, and it falls upon Samus to restore this energy, defeat the Ing, and bring back the Luminoth. This is the narrative context behind the game's light and dark world mechanic, which sees the player travelling between light and dark ether to find items and solve puzzles. In theory, this doubles the amount of space the player has to explore, but in practice it's not as daunting as it might initially seem. Many of the rooms in the dark world are closed off with impassable barriers, so for the majority of the game, journeys to the dark world are more like self-contained puzzle segments. 
The player might need to travel to Dark Aether to find a certain item or solve a particular puzzle before heading back to Light Aether immediately afterwards. The Dark World gradually opens up towards the end, but by this point you'll likely be familiar with the game's map to such an extent that the prospect of a different world to explore isn't overwhelming. Certain devices on Aether are caught in trans-dimensional flux, and this promises some interesting puzzles. For example, opening a door or moving a bridge in the Dark World will also affect its Light World counterpart. This mechanic doesn't really live up to its promises though, and there are only a small handful of these puzzles throughout the entire game. It would have been interesting if this interaction between the light and dark world was explored more, but as it is, it amounts to nothing more than simply activating a few switches. Dark Aether adds a layer of challenge by having the player's health constantly depleting when they're standing in its caustic atmosphere. Light beacons are liberally scattered throughout the dark world, offering brief moments of respite. Standing inside these beacons slowly recharges your health, giving you some time to breathe and gather your bearings. This makes Dark Aether a threatening place to explore, and the constant search for health and light beacons can make journeys to the Dark World an anxious experience, especially early on when you only have two or three health tanks. Thematically speaking, Dark Aether is of course Light Aether's polar opposite, and it's interesting how the health draining mechanic extends this theme to the gameplay itself. In the Light World, you're exploring in classic Metroid fashion, making your way through the game at your own pace, finding upgrades and gradually opening up the map. As soon as you enter the Dark World, there's a sense of desperation to get what needs to be done and leave as soon as possible. The tense atmosphere of the Dark World is reflected wonderfully in its visual and sound design. Its environments are drowned in dark purples, reds and greys, creating an unsettling alien landscape. The music within its various locations is a slow, brooding imitation of their Light World counterparts. For example, the Temple Grounds theme is a fairly upbeat track layered with humming choirs and synthesized drum beats. Its Dark World theme takes these choirs and distorts them amongst echoes of large percussion instruments. It's a brilliant way to make two environments feel distinct but subtly reminiscent of each other, and wandering through the Dark World has a unique, almost uncanny ambience to it. Once Zumas has explained his plight, he sends you back out to the Temple Grounds to restore the planet's lost energy from three major locations. The first stop is the Aegon Wastes. Once a vast landscape lush with fields and flora, the Aegon Wastes have been reduced to a barren wasteland by the meteor. The washed out shades of yellows, greys and browns that saturate the desert ruins paint a bleak picture of the damage Aether has suffered. This muted colour palette is something that's present in most of the game's environments, and it's a slight shift in tone from the relatively vibrant aesthetic of the first game. Talon 4's areas all felt distinct from each other and were extremely memorable as a result. I'd say the major locations on Aether feel slightly less memorable, but are generally more cohesive, and I think this has a lot to do with the choices of colour within both games' level designs. To demonstrate what I mean, I've done my best to break down the basic colour palettes of the major locations in Prime 1 and 2. From my admittedly crude diagram, you can see that Prime 2's environments have a much darker range of colours, with a heavy focus on shades of grey and brown. There's a less diverse colour range too, the Aegon Wastes even shares a colour palette with the Temple Grounds. Prime's wider range of colours makes for a more diverse set of environments, but Prime 2's more homogenous colour palette leaves Aether feeling more consistent it makes a little more sense that the major areas exist within walking distance of each other. The darker colours also reflect the themes of the game's story, creating the perfect backdrop to the tale of a planet drained of its life, and a highly intelligent species on the brink of extinction. Where dark and light ether are very literal interpretations of good versus evil, the subdued colours throughout the game's world provide a more subtle layer of atmosphere to the game's narrative. Shortly after arriving in the Aegon Waste, you'll find the first temple. Before you can access the energy controller, there's the fight against the Bomb Guardian. Having stolen most of Samus's abilities, the Ing have integrated with parts of her suit, creating creatures that use your power-ups against you. Once you've defeated these creatures, you can take back the ability for yourself, and this is how most of the upgrades are obtained throughout the game. As well as using their own strength, the Ing rely on stealing and possessing creatures and technology from the planets they invade. Having to fight the Ing that are using your own technology is a nice way to show how they operate without explaining it to the player outright. 
Once you've gained access to Aegon's energy controller, a Luminoth hologram explains how the controller works and lays out the basic structure of the game. Enter an area, find its temple, go to the Dark World to find the three temple keys, access the Dark Temple to recover its energy and return that energy to the Light World. This is the structure that every area in the game follows, and it's a much more defined and organised layout compared to the first game. In Prime 1, exploration had a kind of aimless feel to it. You'd enter a new area, and from there it was up to you to find your way. The only real direction provided to the player was from the hint system. In Prime 2, as soon as you enter a new area, you already know what you're looking for and what you have to do to progress. The only real variables are where the temple might be and where the keys are hidden. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's a more streamlined approach, and it's easy to see why fans of Metroid's traditionally open-ended design might find Prime 2 structure too focused. Personally, I'm conflicted on how I feel about the overall structure, but I'm definitely not fond of how rigidly this structure is enforced. Once you've retrieved the energy from Dark Aether, the game locks you into the area until you've returned the energy to its temple. I assume this was done so players wouldn't forget to return the energy before moving on, but actively locking them into an area feels like a step too far. The game reminds you to return the energy twice, once from the holograms and once from the message that displays when you've retrieved the energy itself. I think it's safe to say by that point the player would know what they'd need to do, so being locked in feels excessive. Either way, after listening to the Luminoth's message, it's back out into the wastes for the first proper visit to Dark Aether. This first trip to Dark Aegon is fairly short, taking roughly 10 minutes. That's just enough time to give the player a taste of what travelling through the Dark World is like without being too overwhelming. With that said, you'll only have a couple health tanks by this point, so the health draining effect of Dark Aether's atmosphere can be quite severe. Taking those first steps outside of a light beacon knowing the next one is a fair distance away feels a lot like holding your breath, and the tension is only increased when you have enemies to worry about as well. This is the first time you'll encounter the Ing in their raw form, and they make for a pretty unnerving foe. They can prove difficult to predict as they melt into a shadow-like substance and slither around you, forming into bizarre spider-like creatures when they're ready to strike. Some of them try to possess Samus herself, obscuring her vision as they cling to her visor and fight for control. Their immaterial nature lends them a distinct otherworldly quality. They clearly don't follow the same rules of our universe, so they're as intriguing as they are creepy. This initial journey into Dark Aegon culminates with a fight against the Jump Guardian. If the prospect of fighting basic enemies within the Dark World was intense, then fighting a boss isn't exactly a pleasant experience. Thankfully, this fight is a standard fare of dodging well-telegraphed attacks, and it's over pretty quickly, rewarding the Space Jump boots. With these, you can venture further into the Aegon Wastes back in the Light World. It's here that you'll discover the Space Pirate's mining operations on Aether. You can't access their mining station with your current weapons, so you're forced to use the Morph Ball to roll under the floor panels. Upon entering the main station, there's this wonderful moment where you see a squad of Space Pirates entering a dark portal, completely unaware of your presence. It's a great piece of storytelling. It feels like you walked in on their plan, seeing something you're not supposed to see from the relative safety of beneath the floor grating. The Space Pirates have a minimal presence on Aether, and over the course of the game's events, kind of become pushovers as the Ing and Dark Samus take centre stage. The only time the Pirates become a moderate threat is when they're possessed, further demonstrating how powerful the Ing can be. There's no Ridley to speak of either, and it's nice to see the franchise move away from traditional series conventions in favour of a brand new, original antagonist. That's not to say that the Space Pirates don't serve a narrative purpose, though. The presence of Phazon and its abundance in the Dark World is what's attracted them to Aether, hinting at a deeper conspiracy that has ties to the first game. The scan logs within the mining station continue the character development of the Pirates that was seen in the first game, as well as provide some comedic relief. In between data entries detailing their phase on mining and Metroid breeding operations are scan logs warning that Metroids aren't pets or suitable target practice. It's also amusing to read through their panic as they realise there's not one but two Samuses on their tail this time. 
Allusions to Dark Samus's presence in the base soon ring true. As you go further into the mining station, you'll bump into the Dark Hunter herself. I love the body language expressed by the two hunters in this cutscene. They almost mimic each other's movements for a moment before Dark Samus takes the first shots, establishing her as the more reckless of the two. The fight that follows has a nice pace to it, with Dark Samus dashing around the room as you frantically try to hit her with beam attacks. A sense of urgency is conveyed through the soundtrack. Unstable synths are backed up with what sound like warning sirens, putting the player on high alert. Once she's defeated, Dark Samus dissipates into a cloud of Phazon particles. Over the course of the game, these blue particles are used to foreshadow an appearance of Dark Samus, either for a fight or if she's going to hinder you in some way. The player is conditioned to prepare for the worst as soon as they notice these particles in an area, which is a nice touch. Your reward for defeating Dark Samus is the Dark Beam, as well as the Light Beam shortly afterwards. These are the only two beam weapons you'll have until the Annihilator Beam, which comes fairly late into the game. This is a considerable downgrade from Prime 1, which had just as many beams, but they were introduced at regular intervals, which gave a steady increase in combat variety. In Prime 2, you get the two beams almost immediately after each other, and that's it for the majority of the game. As well as dealing high damage to enemies of the opposite type, the Dark and Light Beams function similarly to the Ice and Plasma Beams, respectively. The Dark Beam can freeze enemies in place with a hardened shell of dark energy, and the Light Beam can ignite enemies, causing damage over time. The most notable aspect of both beams is their reliance on ammunition. This was a pretty controversial addition to the game, and although I don't think it's too bad, it does suffer from some balancing issues. The main problem here is that beam weapons serve several functions in Metroid. To fight enemies, open doors, and in Prime 2's case, open light and dark portals. Charging the beams when they're out of ammo fires a single standard shot, so you'll never find yourself stuck, but the issues arise in combat. It costs 5 ammunition to fire a charged shot, so if you only have 5 light ammo left, for example, and have to open a light door, you've wasted that charge shot to perform an action that has nothing to do with combat. This becomes much less of an issue later on in the game when you find more ammo expansions, but early on it can feel slightly unfair. Fortunately, finding ammunition isn't difficult. Shooting a container with one beam will cause it to drop ammo for the other, so you're unlikely to be desperately low on ammunition at any given moment. In relation to the lore, these two weapons were crafted by the Luminoth to fight the Ing, and I love the small Luminoth symbols engraved into the weapons, hinting at their origins. With the two new beam weapons, you have the means to hunt down the three Dark Temple keys and gain access to the Dark Aegon Temple. Entering the temple awakens its guardian, a trio of giant worms collectively known as a Morbus. With the exception of the Dark Samus encounter, this is what I consider to be the first real boss of the game. The sheer spectacle of fighting a Morbus for the first time is one of my fondest memories of Metroid Prime 2. Trying to stave off the Dark World's corrosive atmosphere as the giant worms burst out of the ground and dive over you is genuinely terrifying stuff. The sense of scale that's conveyed when all three worms attach to the sphere in the centre of the arena is impressively threatening. It's far from the largest thing you'll fight in this game, Quadraxis is a little while away yet, but it's a promising sign of things to come. Defeating a Morbis grants the Dark Suit, reducing the health draining effects of Dark Aether by a considerable amount. This makes exploring the Dark World much less risky, but still retains that sense of danger and caution that makes Dark Aether unique. Once you've drained the energy from Dark Aegon's temple, it's time to head back to the Light World to return it to its rightful place. In both Aegon Wastes and Torvus Bog, this triggers some small environmental changes. 
Aegon's electrical storms disappear and the rain in Torvus Bog stops falling. The sun starts to shine through the clouds in these areas as well. I didn't notice these details on my first playthrough, but even so, I'm glad they're in the game. They might be tiny, inconsequential changes, but they lend some weight to returning the energy to its temple, as if you're slowly bringing order back to Aether. With Aegon's energy controller fully restored, it's on to the next area, Torvus Bog. The meteor that struck Aether has transformed the once dense forest of Torvus into a swamp, drowning in the planet's ocean waters. Its troubled past is contrasted by the soundtrack, with an almost hypnotic, peaceful ambience echoing through its marshy landscape. Torvus Bog is a refreshing change of scenery after the dry wastelands of the Temple Grounds and Aegon Wastes. Whilst the meteors scorch those areas to dust, the plants and wildlife of Torvus seem to thrive in their new habitat, with vast networks of tree roots covering most of the scenery. After finding its temple, the first major objective here is travelling to Dark Torvus to fight the Boost Guardian. This fight is notorious for its difficulty, and it's difficult for all the wrong reasons. Even if you beat the Boost Guardian on your first try, it can still feel frustrating above anything else. As far as I can tell, there's no surefire way to predict where the boss is going to boost towards in its ball form, so taking damage here is mostly down to bad luck. You also often have to roll into the boss to deal damage when it's in its liquid form, so you're frequently taking unnecessary hits. Add to this the constant health drain from Dark Aether, and you have a boss that feels clunky and unsatisfying to fight. Either way, you're rewarded for your struggles with the boost ball. This functions exactly the same way it did in Prime, but the level design in Prime 2 makes much more use out of it. Retro nailed the sense of building up momentum, and boosting up halfpipes is a wonderfully satisfying mechanic. It makes great use of the physics that naturally come with controlling a sphere within a 3D space, and it feels intuitive and effortless to use. With the boost ball obtained, there's a small detour back to the temple grounds to get the Seeker missile. This upgrade expands on the basic missile launcher, allowing you to lock on and fire several missiles at once. Whilst opening Seeker doors is satisfying, it's a little too slow to be useful for most combat situations. Even so, it's a brand new way of using an item that's become fairly standard in the series, and this is something that I feel Prime 2 does really well. For example, the boost ball can be combined with the spider ball to hop between railings, and the gravity boost not only lets you walk underwater, but also adds an additional extended jump. It's a refreshing take on classic Metroid items, and these small tweaks help make Prime 2 feel like a sequel, and not just Metroid Prime in a different location. This is as good a time as any to mention the various technical improvements as well. The general sharpness and quality of the game's graphics has been improved, but I think the polish really shines in the game's animations. In Metroid Prime, charging the power beam had a fairly simple animation where a ball of energy formed at the end of the arm cannon. In Metroid Prime 2, this animation is more filled out and smooth, with a brief pulse of energy radiating outwards when it's fully charged. Firing the charged shot now has a blue trail behind it, making it feel more meaty and powerful. Samus herself has some improved animations in the cutscenes as well. Her animations were perfectly serviceable in the first game, but she often looked a bit too rigid and stiff. In Prime 2, her movements are much more fluid and natural, and a lot more expressive as a result. Actions, as they say, speak louder than words, and so much about Samus' personality is conveyed through the way she moves. She's cautious, always on high alert and ready to act, and all of this is shown through her behaviour in the cutscenes. Retro did a wonderful job of making Samus a fully expressive character without using a single line of spoken dialogue, and it's obvious that a lot of care went into animating her body language.
With all these new ideas and improvements, the game has its fair share of reused content as well, mostly in its enemy design. The Grenchlers in Torvis Bog are reskinned Shegoths from Fendrana Drifts. The Corrupted Sentries are reskinned Ions from the Chozo Ruins, and these Harmony class drones are copied wholesale from the Pulse Bombers, once again from Fendrana Drifts. There's also the Ing Smashers in Sanctuary Fortress, which are very similar to the Elite Pirates in the Phazon Mines. These ideas work perfectly fine, so you know, I'm not necessarily complaining, but it would have been nice to see some new enemies in their place. There are some interesting new enemy designs throughout most of the game, but these reused ones tend to stick out. These copied assets and ideas are most likely the result of the game's troubled development. Producer Kensuke Tanabe has stated that the game was only 30% complete three months before its deadline. That's a pretty shocking figure, and it's possible that Retro brought these enemies over to save time and reach their release target. Even so, with such a rushed development, I'm amazed that the game ended up as polished and refined as it is. If anything, it's a testament to Retro's dedication and skill as developers. Getting back on track, returning to Torvisborg with the Seeker Missile allows you to fully explore its lower section, the Hydro Dynamo Station. Completely submerged in water, this area shows a more mechanical side to Torvus, with large machines and metal tunnels in place of tree trunks and plant life. The music here is a beautiful rendition of Red Brinstar's theme from Super Metroid, creating a perfect subaquatic atmosphere. This section has the player trudging through water at a snail's pace, presumably to make getting the gravity boost feel satisfying. The lead up to the gravity suit in Prime 1 did the same thing, but on a much smaller scale. I think it goes on for a bit too long here, taking roughly 20 minutes of slow underwater exploration before obtaining the gravity boost. It goes on for so long that on my first playthrough I'd begun to wonder if I was even supposed to be here yet. To make matters worse, there's a large gap between save stations too. The goal here is to release the three locks and raise the central chamber, giving access to the room with the gravity boost. Immediately after getting the gravity boost, there's a boss fight against the Alpha Blog. There's a good chance you'll not think to save until this point, so if the boss kills you, it's back to the start where you have to redo everything from the beginning of the area. Even if you did think to save, you can't reach the save station after releasing the third lock, so either way there's going to be some tedious backtracking if you die from that point onwards. The general consensus amongst fans is that Prime 2 is the hardest game in the trilogy. Whilst some enemies do seem to deal more damage compared to Prime 1, I think the main source of frustration comes from these large spaces between save points. The Alpha Blog is one example, although the most notorious case is probably with the Spider Guardian in Sanctuary Fortress. More on that later. Both of these fights have a considerable amount of backtracking if you die and carry the sting of artificial difficulty as a result. With that aside though, I wouldn't say that Prime 2 is much more challenging than the first game. The Dark World does ramp things up, but generally you won't find yourself dying too often if you're careful. Hard mode works the same way it did in Metroid Prime, so my thoughts on that are more or less the same this time around. Certain bosses are an absolute nightmare on the higher difficulty, with the most frustrating being their boost guardian. This fight took me upwards of 15 attempts to beat, and even then it was an extremely close call. I'm all for a challenging boss, but playing on hard mode feels more like a frustrating test of endurance than a well-designed test of skill. Anyway, after defeating the Alpha Blog, it's into Dark Torvus to fight the Grapple Guardian. This is my favourite Guardian fight in the game, taking what makes fighting the Grenchlers fun and stretching it out into a boss encounter. This fight is all about good timing and rhythm, waiting for the right moment to dash behind it and deal damage whilst it's tethered to the electric poles. There's this almost dance-like quality to it. 
There's a good amount of space to work with in the arena, so there's plenty of room to move and get the upper hand. When the boss is on low health, the window of opportunity to strike is small, ramping up the tension and increasing the tempo of the battle. Defeating the Guardian rewards the Grapple Beam. I'm always surprised at how solid using the Grapple Beam in first person feels. The arc of your swing is clearly shown through Samus' visor, so it's easy to judge your momentum and know when to let go of the grapple hook. The controls complement this as well. Holding the left trigger activates the beam and releasing it detaches you from the hook. The sense of momentum is conveyed through holding the trigger, so it makes sense that letting go will launch you forwards. With the grapple beam in hand and the three Dark Temple keys found, it's time to fight Dark Torvus' boss, Chika. I won't mince words here, this boss fight is incredible. Everything from its visual design and music to its mechanics and gimmicks are distinctly memorable. There's a great twist on using multiple phases here, with each phase being a new stage in Chika's life cycle. From cocoon to lava to fully grown adult and finally a dark form. In its lava form, Retro did a wonderful job of making this boss feel strange and imposing by combining the visual appearance of an insect lava and the movements of a whale, swimming and diving through the pool of dark sludge. Although this phase is fairly slow, Chika's size and appearance is more than enough to put the player on edge. Throughout this whole fight, you're confined to a small platform floating on a large body of toxic water. Whilst this water hurts Samus, it poses no threat to the boss, so there's this immediate sense that Chika has the upper hand here. Brooding tension turns into all-out panic when the boss bursts out of the water and latches onto you with its tongue, pulling you into its mouth until you break free. The soundtrack adds the finishing touch to this phase, with a slow, methodical track reflecting the sluggish movements of the lava. It's Chika's adult form where things get interesting. In this phase, the platform breaks into three pieces, forcing you to swing across the toxic water from platform to platform with the grapple beam. It's a great way to make the arena feel more dangerous and the player much more nervous. The Seeker missile is used nicely here too, allowing you to take out all four of Chika's new wings at once. I love the visual design of this form. It has some great use of colour, with shades of blue and grey making up its body and wings, fading into the yellows and oranges of its abdomen. Its animations sell its insectoid appearance, with its wings twitching and fluttering when it's hit. If it wasn't trying to kill you, I'd say it almost looks graceful. When Chika becomes corrupted with dark energy, it gains the ability to spawn offspring that swarm towards you, adding even more tension to the battle. Apart from that though, there's nothing too complicated about its dark form, simply requiring a few light beam shots to its abdomen to deal large chunks of damage. Once again, the pace of this phase is reflected in its music, with a more frantic, sped up version of the previous track. After bringing down Chika, you're given the Dark Visor, which is essentially the X-Ray Visor in all but name. It lets you see hidden platforms and switches, and it lets you lock on to certain enemies when they're invisible, much in the same way that you could target the Chozo Ghosts. It also has the added benefit of highlighting enemies in bright red, which can be surprisingly useful for various combat situations. With Chika defeated and Torvus Bog's energy safely restored, it's onwards to the game's final area, Sanctuary Fortress. The Metroid series often has players exploring ancient ruins of long-lost civilizations, and most of the technology you see is usually crude, clunky space pirate tech, so it can be easy to forget that you're playing a science fiction game set in the distant future. 
Sanctuary Fortress is a wonderful reminder of the game's setting, and it feels truly sci-fi. A mechanical fortress built high above Ether's surface, with the walls and floors resembling circuit boards and electrical components. Its metal hallways are lined with brightly coloured neon motifs heavily reminiscent of the grid from Disney's 1982 classic Tron, something the developers were clearly aware of, giving a small nod to the film in the form of a scan log that ends with the phrase, end of line. The technological grandeur of the fortress is established with music that mixes digital, machine-like electronic tracks with choir vocals. What was once the pinnacle of the Luminoth's technical achievements is now all but abandoned, with rogue combat and maintenance drones roaming its neon-lined corridors. These make for some pretty interesting enemies. The floating resbits not only attack you with energy blasts, but also with a computer virus that infects Samus' suit, forcing you to perform a system reboot. This gimmick does become irritating after a while, but I'm glad it's in the game, if only for the surprise it gave me the first time I encountered it. Then there's the quads, four-legged robots that need to be spun out with the boost ball to disable them. Once their body's been destroyed, their head decouples from their legs and carries on attacking you. This is the kind of enemy design I'd love to see more of. Enemies that make you use all of the tools at your disposal, and not just the arm cannon. Straight after discovering Sanctuary Fortress's temple, it's onto this area's first boss, the Spider Guardian. I hate this boss fight. It's a mess. It's slow, it's tedious, and it demands precision that the Morph Ball simply doesn't allow for. There's really no concise way to explain why this boss is such a nightmare, so I'll have to break it down. The boss has a large shield around it that deals big chunks of damage, and you almost always have to put yourself in harm's way to stun it. There are certain safe spots where you can place bombs to stun it without taking damage, but this means waiting for the Guardian to slowly crawl to specific places. Waiting in this fight simply isn't an option since the bomb slots are on a timer. As soon as that timer is up, it's back to square one with that particular phase. The boss also has a very precise hitbox, and there are moments where it's well within the Morph Ball Bomb's radius, but the damage just doesn't register. The final phase is where this fight goes from irritating to outright frustrating thanks to the slopes leading up to the bomb slots. Roll up the slope too slowly and you'll roll back down. Roll up too quickly and you'll often roll over to the other side. You're fighting with the physics to stop the morph ball at the right moment, by which point the timer for the bomb slots has likely reset and yeah, it's it's a mess. There's also the issue of the save station gap. According to my footage, it only takes about 5 minutes to retread your steps back to the boss after dying, but that's 5 minutes that could be easily replayed over and over because of the boss's difficulty. I wouldn't say that this is the biggest issue this boss has, but it definitely adds insult to injury. Thankfully, the fight ends before it gets any worse, rewarding the spider ball. In Metroid Prime, I'd say the spider ball reached its peak with the plasma beam puzzle in Magmore Caverns. Prime 2 uses it to its full potential, and there's a number of puzzles that make great use out of this mechanic. To give a couple of examples, this section in Torvis Bog has you sticking to moving metal parts to climb a big machine that towers over the swamp's canopy. And in Sanctuary Fortress, there's a series of spider ball tracks that has you dodging mechanical arms and moving in between machinery. Giving some added functionality to the spider ball is the ability to launch yourself between tracks with the boost ball. Combining these two abilities was a stroke of genius, and it gives the developers even more scope to create some interesting puzzles. It's even integrated into a mini-boss fight in Sanctuary Fortress, which sees the player hopping between railings to damage a hostile caretaker drone. All of this is to say that the Morph Ball reaches new heights in Prime 2, both mechanically and literally. It's clear that Retro had a great appreciation for the Morph Ball, and given how much trouble they went through to make it work in the first game, it's great to see them exploring the mechanic so thoroughly. Before you can explore Sanctuary Fortress further, there's a small detour to Torvus Bog to get the Powerbomb. 
It's worth noting that this is only the second major backtrack in the game, which I would say is a huge improvement over Metroid Prime. There's a good number of compelling arguments in defense of backtracking, especially where Metroid is concerned, but when it's poorly handled, it can feel more tedious than anything else. The main difference between backtracking in Prime versus Prime 2 is that Prime required the player to backtrack to obtain key items, whereas Prime 2 keeps most of its key items contained within each area. This means that you're not going across the entire map to pick up a single compulsory upgrade. Instead, you're thoroughly exploring each area, and most of the major backtracking is reserved for optional pickups like health tanks and missile expansions. I'd say this is the best of both worlds. Exploration is still a core component of the gameplay, but there's much less tedium this time around. Players that want to fully explore the map are rewarded with more health and missiles, and those that simply want to progress through the game rarely need to do any serious backtracking. This adds to the number of ways that the Prime Trilogy accommodates more than one kind of player. In my Metroid Prime video, I talked about how this philosophy was applied to the game's storytelling. Here in Prime 2, it extends further into the gameplay. I suppose the elephant in the room here is the hunt for the Sky Temple keys, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Anyway, the Powerbomb Guardian is one of the easiest bosses in the game, but it makes good use of the Spider Ball. The entire fight takes place on a network of Spider Ball tracks as you make your way around the arena to decouple clamps holding a bridge in place. Since the Guardian's power bombs don't deal much damage, the only real threat here is getting knocked off the railings, which leaves this fight feeling more like a navigation puzzle. It's a welcome change of pace after the frustrating Spider Guardian, and it's yet another example of how the game uses the Spider Ball to its full potential. After crushing the Guardian under a bridge and getting the power bomb, it's back to Sanctuary Fortress. Returning here with the power bomb grants access to a large elevator where the player has their second encounter with Dark Samus. Just before the battle, there's a brilliant moment where you're forced to watch Dark Samus destroy a squad of dark pirate troopers like it's nothing before feeding off a few Phazon canisters. She's clearly gotten more powerful since your last encounter, and the way this scene is presented makes the player nervous to fight her. This increase in power is shown through her behavior in the cutscenes. She's more reckless this time, immediately attacking Samus upon seeing her and cackling maniacally between phases. Much like the player, she's picked up some new tricks of her own, being able to turn invisible and boost around the elevator with her morph ball. There's something to be said about how unsettling Dark Samus is. At this point in the trilogy, her origin is extremely vague. Players who got 100% completion in Prime 1 will know that she spawned from Metroid Prime, but her intentions and motivations at this point are unclear. She's not sided with the Ing or the Space Pirates, and this ambiguity teases a bigger story running underneath everything else. She can clearly overpower what are supposed to be the main enemy forces, so you're always left questioning who she's allied with and what her purpose is. Shortly after defeating Dark Samus for the second time, you'll find the Echo Visor. This is, without a doubt, one of my favorite items in the game based on its concept alone, allowing the player to visualize sound waves in the environment. When developing Metroid Prime, the story goes that Shigeru Miyamoto asked Retro Studios what would it be like if Samus had a bug's head. After some puzzling, the developers eventually realized that Miyamoto was talking about the idea of altered perception, and this gave birth to the different visors. Whilst the X-ray and thermal visors are great additions to the series, the Echo Visor feels like a true realization of that initial concept. Thermal and X-ray vision are things we've all seen before, but being able to see sound really embraces this idea of perceiving the world differently. The developers clearly loved this mechanic, going through the effort to make everything that creates sound resonate with the visor. For example, charged shots produce louder, bigger sound waves than a standard shot, and all the enemies create sound waves that look appropriate for the sounds they make. It's just a shame that the visor is somewhat underutilized. 
for a good portion of the game, you'll only be using it to look for hidden sound-producing devices that are keeping certain doors locked. Getting the Annihilator Beam later on lets you solve these Sonic-based puzzles by creating a tune that resonates with locked doors correctly, but there's only a tiny handful of these throughout the whole game. It seems to almost reach its full potential, but never fully utilises that potential. With that said, that tiny handful of puzzles are some of my fondest memories of Prime 2, and it's cool that the item exists in the first place. Just as an interesting side note, back in the Aegon Wastes, there's a dead Luminoth body that the scan visor reveals to have been blind, and used a cybernetic enhancement to see the world around him with echolocation. This is obviously alluding to the echo visor, and it's a fantastic piece of world building. Not only is the Echo Visor a unique gameplay mechanic, it also has a reason to exist within the game's universe. It's, it's a really nice little detail. The next item you'll obtain in Sanctuary Fortress is the Screw Attack. On my first playthrough, when I first reached the screw attack, I remember staring at the screen in disbelief for a few moments. I'd previously played Super Metroid, so I knew what the screw attack was, and I was having a hard time grasping how they'd implement it into a 3D first-person game. As seen with the Morph Ball, Retro clearly have a knack for handling sudden switches to third-person, but I'd say the screw attack is the most impressive example. The transition from jumping to screw attack is incredibly smooth, and you're never left feeling disoriented. This is hugely important with the screw attack in particular, because you're always in motion. There's no time to gather your bearings after switching, since you're committed to the jump until you cross the gap. I often find myself using this to speed up walking through areas I've already been through. It feels so natural to use that it's a viable alternative to walking if you're faced with a large open space. My only complaint here is that it's not exactly intuitive to use at first. The message that pops up telling you how to use the item tells you to press B repeatedly after space jumping, and it's easy to imagine someone fruitlessly mashing B to use the screw attack. There's a certain rhythm to using it properly, and repeatedly pressing B will only ever end in frustration. Players who are familiar with the 2D Metroid games might understand how to use it right away, but it's highly likely that many people playing Prime 2 won't have that prior knowledge. As well as being able to cross large gaps, the screw attack allows the player to wall jump on specific surfaces. These are few and far between, but even so, it's great that Retro managed to implement this into the game. On paper, this idea sounds like it shouldn't work, but they managed to pull it off perfectly. With the screw attack, you can collect all of Sanctuary Fortress's Dark Temple keys. It's time to head into its temple to face Quadraxis. This heavily armoured and weaponized security drone now belongs to the Ing, and stands between you and the energy controller. Now, this thing is absolutely massive, and I think it goes without saying that it's one of the most impressive bosses in the game. Quadraxis is hugely intimidating, and at first glance seems impenetrable. Lots of games have the player fighting huge, larger-than-life creatures, but few manage to make it feel genuinely exciting. They often fall into the trap of having you take down large monsters by hitting one or two weak points, and this usually feels unsatisfying. With Quadraxis, you're gradually breaking it down piece by piece in a slow but intense struggle that has you thinking on your feet and giving it everything you've got. The first phase has you taking out its legs by shooting the hinges, with each destroyed joint causing it to stumble and lose balance. In the second phase, its head detaches from its broken body, receiving signals from an antenna. The echo visor is used to locate the antenna and disrupt its signal, rendering the head module vulnerable for a few moments. 
Destroying both the antenna and the receivers on Quadraxis's head triggers the final phase against its damaged head module. This phase is absolutely brilliant, utilising the spider ball to climb up its legs and launch onto its head to deal damage with morph ball bombs. Defeating Quadraxis involves figuring out how it works and systematically taking it down. It's an incredibly satisfying boss to overcome and a great conclusion to Sanctuary Fortress. The item rewarded here is the Annihilator Beam, combining both light and dark energy into a more powerful, concentrated shot. Shooting a light crystal or beacon with this new beam supercharges it, pulling nearby Ing into its light field and destroying them. It's a useful feature that makes going back through areas much less of a hassle, and like the Plasma Beam in Prime 1, its high damage is a nice reward for getting this far into the game. Restoring the energy to Sanctuary Fortress marks the final step in your mission, or so you'd think. Upon returning to Umos, he reveals that there's a fourth and final energy controller inside the Sky Temple, which you'll need nine keys to enter. To make up for sending her on a last minute scavenger hunt, he gives Samus the light suit. On top of looking absolutely stunning, the light suit grants immunity to Dark Aether's harmful atmosphere. I suppose this is comparable to the Phazon suit in Prime 1 since it takes a threat and negates its damage, but it's executed much better here. Phazon was never really much of an issue in the first game, save for a few small areas, so having the means to resist it was fine, but ultimately not especially useful. Dark Aether, on the other hand, is something that's been a constant threat throughout the entire game. Its harmful atmosphere restricted exploration and was always on the player's mind, so finally getting your hands on the light suit feels extremely liberating. This opens up the dark world in a big way, and it begins to feel like a proper environment to explore, no longer a place you dread going back to. Speaking of things that you dread going back to, this final stretch of the game has you hunting for the nine Sky Temple keys. Metroid Prime pulled the same trick with its Chozo artifacts, although this time around it has some problems, so I'm just going to whine about this for a bit. In the Metroid Prime review, I defended the Chozo artifact hunt by saying that you could start looking for the artifacts fairly early into the game. You could enter the artifact temple once you had the missile launcher, and from there you could scan the clues and find the artifacts as you went through the game at its usual pace. You can't start finding the Sky Temple keys until you have the Dark Visor. For comparison, in my Metroid Prime footage, I found the missile launcher roughly 30 minutes into the game. In Prime 2, I got the Dark Visor in just under 5 hours. Even with the Dark Visor, you'll still need to know to look for the keys in the first place. The first time the keys are even mentioned is in a Luminoth lore scan just outside the elevator to Sanctuary Fortress, which you won't reach until you're well past the game's halfway point. The clues for finding the artifacts in Prime 1 were all collected in one place, with more clues being revealed as you found more artifacts. The clues for the Sky Temple keys are spread out across the entire game world in the form of dead key bearers. You can gather a second set of clues from the Sky Temple Gateway itself, but they're extremely vague. It's much less convenient and much more hassle than it needs to be. The Chozo artifacts were straightforward in that you'd likely stumble across a few just by exploring. The conditions for finding the Temple Keys are much more specific. You need to remember the locations of the dead key bearers, go to that location's Dark World counterpart, and then use the Dark Visor to see the floating in cache and destroy it to reveal the key. 
Suffice it to say I'm not fond of the scavenger hunt this time, although it does still have the benefit of giving the player one last chance to go back through the game and find things they might have missed. To alleviate some of the tedium, a fast travel system becomes available, allowing you to quickly travel between the three temples. I said in my Prime video that some kind of fast travel between save stations would have been useful, but this feels like a good middle ground. You can quickly travel to each of the major areas, but it doesn't render exploration pointless. You still have to walk through the areas and explore, it's just more convenient to get to those areas in the first place. Ultimately though, the Sky Temple keys are a more tedious version of something that was executed much better in the previous game. It feels more like padding this time, and I find it difficult to justify its inclusion. I'm tempted to say it was put in there just because it was in Metroid Prime. Either way, once you've found the nine Sky Temple keys, you can enter the Sky Temple itself, where the Emperor Ing guards the final energy controller. The fight against the Emperor Ing consists of three phases, each with its own form. In this first phase, the Emperor takes on the form of a mass of Ing flesh and tentacles, with a hardened shell guarding its inner core. Shooting all of its tentacles reveals the core, and this is its weak spot. Landing a hit with a super missile is accompanied by a satisfying crunch as a large chunk of its health is taken away. For the most part, this phase isn't too tricky, although the penalty for getting hit with the laser from its core lasts a bit too long. Getting hit renders you unable to shoot for about 5 seconds, which feels a second or two longer than it should. Its second form is a large hardened shell that the player clings to with the spider ball, damaging its tentacles when they burst out. A cloud of noxious gas slowly consumes the arena, forcing the player on top of the shell before it sinks back down. Once again, this phase is fairly simple. The dominant strategy here is to spam power bombs once its tentacles are revealed. The Ing moving around the shell drop both power bombs and health, so there's really no reason not to use as many power bombs as possible. The Emperor's final form is much more intimidating, resembling a bigger, more imposing Ing warrior. Its weak spot sits in its mouth, switching between dark and light polarities that are vulnerable to the opposite beam. Because the dark beam has such a long travel time, it's extremely tricky to land a shot when the Emperor's core is light. The light beam's travel time is almost instant, so the ideal situation is for the core to turn dark. It's a small issue, but it leaves this phase feeling slightly unbalanced. With that aside, the battle against this form is pretty exciting. The size of the boss is conveyed wonderfully, with the screen shaking as it leaps around the arena and charges towards you. The Emperor feels like a culmination of all the Ing you've fought against so far, and it makes for a great ending to the Ing menace. Once you've overloaded its core, the Emperor finally admits defeat, exploding into a shower of dark particles and revealing the last of Aether's stolen energy. It wouldn't be a Metroid game if things were that straightforward though, so Dark Aether begins to collapse, triggering a timed escape sequence. Just as you think you've made it, Dark Samus appears one last time to try and finish you off. Completely overridden with Phazon, Dark Samus has taken on a much more alien appearance, resembling Metroid Prime in a humanoid form. The copious amounts of Phazon coursing through her body has made her incredibly powerful, being able to fire large bursts of the stuff towards you. You're not just up against Dark Samus this time, you're also against the clock, 
There's more than enough time to finish the job, but on a first playthrough, this is an extremely stressful moment. For this final encounter, Dark Samus is impervious to all of your weaponry. The only way you can damage her is by catching her shards of Phazon with your charge beam and throwing them back. This is a more complex take on how you defeated Metroid Prime. There you have to simply stand in pools of Phazon, but here it feels more involved, as you attempt to draw in as much as possible to throw back. After some struggling, Dark Samus is eventually overloaded with Phazon, and you finally defeated her for good. As hordes of Ings swarm around Samus, she makes a break for the portal to light Ether, escaping the Dark World and restoring order to the Luminoth's homeworld. This brings an end to Metroid Prime 2. Samus is greeted by a crowd of grateful Luminoth as they watch their saviour leave with nothing but a simple wave. If I had to summarise my thoughts on both games in a few sentences, I'd say that Metroid Prime is an extremely memorable experience as a whole, and Prime 2 is more a game of memorable moments. I'll never forget my first steps onto Talon 4 and the adventure that followed, but in the same way I'll never forget fighting the Ing-possessed bodies of Galactic Federation troopers, entering Sanctuary Fortress for the first time, or exploring the waters of Torbus Bog. As much as I love Metroid Prime, there's no denying that it played it fairly safe. Although it's a fantastic game in its own right, most of its elements came from previous Metroid titles, most notably Super Metroid. Retro Studios was under a lot of pressure to deliver a game that was unmistakably Metroid, and they were basically tasked with revitalising the franchise. Their solution was to create a game that brought established formulas and ideas into the third dimension, and this worked extremely well. With Metroid Prime 2, Retro took these ideas and began to add their own twists and personal touches, not only in the new approaches to classic Metroid items, but also with the light and dark world mechanics. These elements are what make Prime 2 feel like a successful sequel. It's not just another entry in the Prime series, it's a game that began to branch out in its own direction. I don't hold Metroid Prime 2 in the same regard as the first game, but at the very least it's a worthy sequel to one of the best games of its generation. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next video.